take your Bibles this morning and put your finger in 1 John 1, 9. You all know what the verse that is. While you're turning there, I just want to read to you a few statements that have been made over the years by different famous people about forgiveness. And we've been on this subject of forgiveness for several weeks now, but I believe it's a subject that is not talked about enough. And uh, unfortunately, most people <clears throat> won't go to church anymore because they've gotten hurt. Because somebody was very judgmental and non-forgiving and didn't like the way they looked or didn't like the way they act or didn't like something about something and they said something and the next thing you know there was hurt feelings and people would say, well, I just won't go to church. And this is the environment that we live in trying to get people to come to church but we got Christian people who are uh, we, we're just we become so judgmental and we got if people don't fit in a certain box I, I'll tell you I'm of the mind if you got something to cover your body and you can come if you're barefoot or whatever and you can come to the house of God you need to come I'm telling you that's the way I feel about it I mean the Lord and the Holy Spirit will work out all the little details amen that's what I'm here for I preach and they'll get He'll come under the preaching of the Word of God and they'll hear what's supposed to be and the, and the standards and, and what, what's in the Bible and they'll change on their own. If, you go cha if you've ever tried to change somebody, it doesn't work very well, does it? Uh, go ahead and marry that person and say, well, I'm going to change them. And that never happens. They're going to be who they are. Amen? They say that we are who we are by the age of five. And that we carry that with us the rest of our lives as our personalities. Let me, let me read a couple things. Some really uh, thought-provoking statements. This is Mark Twain. Forgiveness is the fragrance the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. Wow, that's pretty good, huh? Once a woman has forgiven her man, she must not reheat his sins for breakfast. Marlene Dietrich. It's easier to ask forgiveness than it is to get permission. To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Forgiveness is a funny thing. It warms the heart and cools the sting. Forgiveness does not change the past, but it does enlarge the future. If you can't forgive and forget, just pick one. It's easier to forgive an enemy than it is to forgive a friend. Oh, man. Think about that one for a while. You might want to write that one down. I'll say that again. Amen. It is easier to forgive an enemy than it is to forgive a friend. Forgiveness is the sweetest revenge. Forgive all who have offended you, not for them, but for yourself. He who cannot forgive breaks the bridge over which he must pass. There's no point in bearing a hatchet if you're going to put it up a marker on the site. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Nobody forgets where he buried the hatchet. We always remember, don't we? There is no revenge so complete as forgiveness. One thing you will probably remember well is any time you forgive and forget. Let me say that one again. You didn't get that. One thing you will probably remember well is any time you forgive and forget. Always forgive your enemies. Nothing annoys them so much. Forgiveness. I'd like to preach to you this morning on how we talked about personal forgiveness, how to go to somebody and, and the different things involved in that the last several weeks. This morning I'd like to preach a message on the forgiving Church, boy, we need forgiving church. We need to be able to forgive people, amen? We need to love people right where they, you know what you can't, you ever tried to lead a drunk to the Lord and you, you're out there and you're telling them, you, if you don't put that beer down, you're going straight to hell, it doesn't work very well. You've got you to gotta let them uh, get saved first and then God will take all that other stuff away later. You can't. Uh, judge people like that and tell them stuff like that, but that's that's the the new theology of our church today. We gotta we gotta people, you gotta change before you can. No, you know what? I love the story of the old story of D. L. Moody, 
that he had the first bus ministry in the 1800s there ever was. He went out and he got him an old hay wagon, and he went down in the poor ghetto part of town, and he started picking up the poor, the destitute, the, the I mean, just poverty-ridden people that were in rags, and he put them on that wagon and took them down to the local, I, I think it was a Methodist church. It doesn't really matter the name on the door. It doesn't really matter. But he took them in, and he filled up a whole section in the church. And they went and told him, he said, you've got to get all these people out of here. They're smelling up the place. Whoa. You know what he did? He went down the street and started his own church. And he filled up thousands of people came to hear him preach. D.L. Moody, it's a true story. And yet we, we need to learn to love other people. We need to learn the act of forgiveness in our lives, in our families, and in our churches. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you would come and meet with us today. We've already had some most beautiful music. The hymns have been stirring our hearts, the offertory, and the good solo by Nancy and others singing and worshiping you in song. And Lord, we're just getting warmed up. Lord, I pray that you would empower me and anoint me, that I would preach with boldness here this morning, that I would preach my heart people would know that I love them and that we would love one another. That they've come to a church where it, all, it, all it matters is that we serve the Lord and the Holy Spirit will work in the heart and change us the way we need to be. Amen? Lord, we pray that you would show us that way through the scriptures and through the preaching of the Word of God today that this church will be a lighthouse in these dark days that surround us on every front and that this church will be a place where people can come and understand that they walk in the halls of this place, that there's a whole bunch of people that forgive them for everything that they've ever done and that they just want to love them and that Jesus loves them right where they're at. And Lord, we pray that as I preach this message this morning, that we'll take something home and that we'll just improve on our Christian walk and that this will be an even greater and stronger church than it already is. Lord, work in our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we need to talk about becoming a forgiving church. Now first of all, let's go ahead and read our, our uh, text verse this morning. You know it. Uh, you, you probably have memorized this as a young person. But in uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What part of the word all did you not get? You know what? Jesus, He forgives everything. When you got saved, he forgave you of everything you've ever done wrong. Everything you're going to do wrong. Did you ever think about that? Amen. And I mean, he, he forgave all of you, not just part of you. And He loves you so much that He wants you to get that, get that from Him so you can go out and forgive everybody else. And come to a local New Testament Bible-believing church like this one where you can put that into practice. Amen. Many of us have either heard or read something like this. If I sin, I'd rather go to the bar than go to the church. The world is saying we are more forgiving than the church. We forgive abortion. We forgive homosexuals. We forgive premarital sex. We forgive drug pushers. We forgive murderers, etc. But we need to distinguish this morning the, between the church as it is and the church as it should be. Amen? That's what we're going to look at this morning. Those two things. The church as it is, not very good shape, but how the church should be as God's people. As it is, many have forgiven, but have not grown much in their Christ likeness. Their forgiveness is not much like Christ. They just, uh, uh, yeah, okay, I'll, put a, I'll tolerate you. But I, I don't know if I can ever forgive you because you are just a mess and your life is a mess and you just don't fit in around here because we're a bunch of Baptist people and we believe the Bible and we believe in the standards of the Bible and you know what? Your standards are just pretty low. How do you get people to get their standards high? By loving them. Let the Lord do the work. Amen? Amen. Their forgiveness is not anything like Christ. 
Many tend to act like the world or like the Pharisees did in John chapter 8. Remember that when the lady was taken in adultery? What did they want to do to her? Stone her. What did they want to do to the man? Let him go. Isn't that the way it usually is? Amen? There's this group over here. They're righteous and self-righteous and their nose is so brown. I mean, it's just, I mean, you know, they're just, they're just in love with their self and they're walking around like that. And then there's this other group over here. They're trying to come in and they're trying to learn something and they're hungry for the Word of God. But what do we do? We smash them. You just don't fit in around here. Some churches and some of us have handled sin that way by cutting people off and ignoring sin. Sometimes when the world criticizes, they have a point. Even though their way of forgiving is wrong, we have not always provided a good model as God's people on how to forgive people. We have not put it out there. So for the next few minutes, I'd like to preach to you on that idea of becoming a forgiving church. First of all, this morning, we need to be people who remember that we have been forgiven. Where did you come from? Have you always been so righteous? Have you always known the Word of God? Have you always been saved? No. Have you always done the right thing? Have you always made the right decisions? No. Pharisees have forgotten that. The Pharisees. Do you know there's modern day Pharisees? Hello. Come on now. They do not say to themselves, he is sinning, and I also. They don't think that way. Matthew 7, 3 and 4 says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Man, clean up your own kitchen before you worry about the grease in mine. Hello. And you know what? Every single one of us this morning, we got a lot of grease in our kitchen. We need to clean it up. But you know what? It, it's, it, it, God did not appoint us as judges to go around and tell everybody how to clean up themselves and to do this and do that. That's not our job. That is not what we're called to do. God called us to seek and save that which is lost. And how do we do that? By loving people where they live. I'm telling you, you want to become a friend of somebody that's down and out, just go up and just love on them a little bit. And tell them, hey man, whatever I can do, put, put your arm around them and say, hey man, whatever I can do to be a friend, don't, you know, don't try to beat them up with the word. Get your big family Bible out and start beating the, the dog out of them. Try to be there for them. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm, I've seen it so many times in the church and and, and new people come and they don't look like the rest of us and somebody gets their hair up on the back of their neck and they, they flip out and they say, we got to do something about that guy. Wasn't that why they're here? Hello? Somebody help me here. Isn't that why people come to church? So they can get that thing straightened out? You know what? That's the reason why they even showed up and got out of bed and they were searching for some answers from the Word of God to come and meet somebody at the local house of God that might just love them a little bit. But what do we do? We forget the immense forgiveness that we got. We've forgotten that we're all just sinners saved by grace. Don't you just love that old song? Amen? I'm telling you, they forget, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen. Amen. We take all this credit for all these things that we have done, but in reality, we haven't done anything. Amen. Only by the grace of God do we have what we have to do what we do, to uh, receive the talents that we are able to use for the Lord and uh, go out into the community and have a job and minister to people through whatever profession God called you to be. Do you know that policemen, as a ministry, it's a calling of God? Hello? Well, I know that because I live with one. Dad used to drive by this house when I was a little boy. He'd say, there's a mother that lives there. 
she needs a lot of help, and there's two little boys, and I'm going to help them. She was a prostitute. She was a prostitute. She had to go pick them up and bring them home and throw them straight in the bathtub. They stunk. They were nasty. They didn't even have any clothes. And we didn't have, a, Dad and Mom didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up as a little kid. And he'd go out and he'd buy them clothes and buy them a bike and, and send them home back to that environment. And he'd drive by that house and he'd just, just see that tears welled up in his eyes. You know what he said to me one time? He said, Bill, you know what the greatest reward I have in life as a police officer? He said one day a, a, a young man who was grown, all grown up, whom I had arrested, came and knocked on my door and said, are you Detective King? And he said, yes. And he said, well, you locked me up years ago and you saved my life. And you know what, Dad used to get really mad at me when he'd be sitting right out here and I'd be telling these little stories about him. And I'd get home and I'd, I'd really get it. And he'd say, don't talk about me like I'm, the, I'm just so perfect and everything. But he's not. But he loved and he was forgiving of other people. Amen? Listen, if we're going to be our best, remember that the pit that we were rescued from, if we're going to be our best, we need to quit being shocked by another's uh, sin and feeling so superior that we're so much better than they are. Because we're not. When we read of someone who had in a moment of rage abused their child because the child wouldn't stop crying, what kind of thoughts go through your mind? Oh, we'll take that guy out and we'll hang him. I mean, we'll tear his limbs off of him. That's what we think, isn't it? What a wretch. How can anybody hurt a child? Listen, I'm not talking about excusing this sin. I'm talking about standing ready to forgive because we don't have, because we don't have such a high view of ourselves. Yes, that's true. Paul said, you think too much of yourselves, more than you ought to. You see, we, we think once we get saved that we've, we've made it. Can I tell you something? Man, it's just a start. We're to, it's a start. We just started on that path. I mean, we got a long way to go, amen? I told somebody this morning, man, I was heaven bound. Man, I was ready to go uh, down to the, up to glory. But all you good, wonderful people prayed me back, amen? And so I'm here for a little while. God's not through with me yet. Praise God for my family and my wife and my kids. But I want you to know that I was okay with that. To go to heaven. Secondly, it's that different from the world very different what's the world is the world different than us you know that's what the problem is you see that the world does not this is what's happened okay can we just preach this morning can we just get to meddling a little bit <laughs> what do you think Fred you meddle, meddle a little bit this morning amen I hope we can but see that's what's happened the world cannot distinguish a difference between how they think and how, boy, this is sad. They, they think, well, you know, you're no different than we are. We're actually better than, we treat our people better than you do. Can I say to you, sometimes that's true? That we take our, uh, our guy and he, he gets into some trouble, whoever it is. I'm not putting any names on nothing. I'm just saying this in general this morning. A person gets in trouble, whatever that problem is, and they, and they go out, and they, I mean, they get in some really bad trouble. And the next thing you know, the Baptists all get together and have a meeting. We need to get rid of that guy. He will mess us up. Whatever happened to uh, getting a little group of guys together to pray? To get on our knees and lift up somebody's, lift up their burdens and say, Lord, Here's our brother, and they're suffering, and they've really made a mistake, and we want to restore them, and we want to love them back, and we want to have them come back into the church house, and we want you to use him again, or her again, or whoever it is. And this is how that God begins to work. And let me tell you something. It's those ones that have been down in the bottom of the pits that have been down there, and they've seen the mud. They've seen how ugly it gets. They've seen how bad it gets. Those are the great preachers. Those are the guys, that, those are the girls that come back and do something for God when somebody cares. Somebody cares. See, 
acceptance is the world's view. It, it, it's, it, what they have is unconditional acceptance. This is the difference now. Let me, let me, let me give this to you. I mean, this is preaching this morning, man. The world thinks about unconditional acceptance. I accept you regardless of who you are and what you've done. Now, stay with me here because forgiveness and condoning are two different 180 degrees apart. We are not to condone sin. We are not to say it's okay, that there are no standards of God, that God didn't write the Bible, that he didn't die for your sins because of sin. We're not saying that at all. That's the difference. We have to distinguish that difference. You see, the believer is to be forgiving. Forgives. We need to call sin what it is. We refuse to condone or ignore sin. I'm not talking about throwing people away here. I'm just saying recognize sin for what it is. But gladly forgives. Here's the part where we miss the boat. We identify the sin. Man, we're good at that. Oh, yeah. yeah, that guy. Oh, man, he's bad. He's bad news. Well, we can identify it real easy. What's that second part that we have so much trouble with? Amen? We don't know how to forgive. We've forgotten how to do it. Mark eleven twenty six 26 says, But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your, your trespasses. That's me and you. So if you can't forgive your brother and you can't try to get along and try to help them to, to restore them to what, where they were, and by the way, I just said it a minute ago, I'm telling you, these people, when you restore them, they, they get serious about God, man. I mean, they really understand how it was down there and they don't want to go back. I don't ever, listen, I made some really bad choices in my life way back when I was a young yonder person, amen, and God beat me up with his big stick. I mean, he, bit, he literally beat me with an inch of my life. Ask my wife sometime quietly behind the scenes, amen. She'll tell you all about it. I mean, my kids, listen to me now. She's right here. There it is. They never seen me smoke a cigarette. They've never seen me on drugs. Why? Because I told the Lord, Lord, I want my children to understand and know the things of God. I don't want them to know that their daddy was messed up. I don't want them to know about how he was. I made some bad choices, but God, you see, that's, that's what it's all about. Because in my life, in the way that I was, there was people that God sent along the way. By the way, where'd they learn it? Church. From the preacher. From some other guy who sat next to them. Man, I'm telling you, God sent the men in my life. And no matter how far I went away from God, how hard I ran and ran for my life, and the deeper in sin I got, next thing I know, somebody showed up at my door, some church guy. There he was, the guy from my past. What are you doing here? Well, I heard you needed help. Huh? That's God. Amen? Doesn't Jesus hate sin and love the sinner? Yes. But don't ever forget the need for repentance. Over whom doth the, the wrath of God hang? You see, that's where the difference has to come in. That's the difference between the world. They, they forgive and they don't even forgive. They condone sin. That's why it looks so much like forgiveness, amen? They just let it all happen and let it all hang out, and it's all okay. We're not going to judge you. We're in the Baptist church, amen, where we come to church. We're not to judge them, no, but we are to understand that there are some problems and pray for them and lift them up and try to restore them so that why? So that they can repent from their sins, so that God may use them again and their hearts be wiped clean again and they be a new creature in Jesus Christ, amen? Jesus loves sinners, but not to the degree that their sin can be ignored. Jesus isn't ignoring their sins. Well, if he did that, he wouldn't have had to die on the cross, right? I mean, if everybody just got to do whatever they wanted to, and it was just open, I mean, you know, do whatever you want. That's the world. So we have to distinguish that and understand that principle and teach that to a lost and dying world 
that yes, uh, we, we, we don't condone sin, but at the same time, we're a forgiving people, and we forgive people, and we, we want to restore you. We want to be a blessing to you. We want to help you. If you're, if you're hungry, we'll feed you. If you're needy, we'll give you clothes. If you need a place to stay, we'll help you. And whatever we can do to help you, to be restored in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, that is the mandate of God. The mind of God. That is a position of grace through repentance and faith. And boy, that's, the, that's what's wrong with salvation today. That's what's wrong with our churches today. And they're preaching the easy believism. Oh, you just put Jesus in your heart and everything will be okay. Well, that's a good start, but you better repent of your sins, amen? You better turn from your wicked ways, and you better have uh, something in your life to show that Jesus Christ is the king of your life, amen? So what would Jesus do? Many folks don't have a clue in our churches today. So how do we become a good church, a forgiving church? Thirdly, it's easier to ignore or condone than to forgive. Those who choose to ignore and condone sin do not come down on God's side. You see, those who forgive hold that person guilty of their offense. They rebuke him and call him to repent and confess. They promise never to bring it up again to his hurt. Hello? Boy, I need to say that one again. We, we promise never to bring it up again right. and again and again and again. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah. As we get on the phone that Sunday night, <laughs> Sunday afternoon, and, you know, did you hear about so and 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 so? And they get on the phone, they call the next one, the next one, the next one. That's the church director. Somebody once called the church directory one of the most evil publications ever published for a Baptist church because of that. They seek his good at great cost. Hello? Sometimes, let me say this to you. Sometimes, folks, men, women, guys and girls, and everybody that's here, sometimes when you line yourself up with somebody that's in a mess, Hello, stay with me here. It makes you look bad. And you're trying to help somebody, and you're trying to do uh, something for somebody to, to restore them, and the brethren all get together, and they say, that crazy preacher, man, he's lost his marbles. Look who he's hanging out with. Yeah. Instead of praying for them and saying, you know what? The preacher really loves people. And he just wants to help people and restore them back. Amen. You see, well, sometimes when we line ourselves up with people and forgive them, it will cost you something. It will cost you something. Are you getting this today? This is real stuff. This is preaching. You see, they get involved at the point of a sin, and often people turn on them viciously and say, man, don't go over to that place. You know, so and so and so and so's over there. I thought, come on now, okay? I thought this was a place where people come that need something from the Lord. Don't you think? So why are we? Why would we? Why would we do that? Why? Why are? What is? We are so messed up in our thinking. We have become so much like the world that we can't even forgive ourselves, let alone forgive our brother and sister. Yes. Amen? And forgive the preacher or, or forgive uh, whoever it is. They say that the congregation goes and has the preacher for lunch on Sunday. <laughs> let me tell you something. If you're not careful, the preacher has the congregation for lunch. <laughs> you sit down and, and uh, we'd have to sit to, uh, say to ourselves on Sunday afternoons, our kids were real little, and we'd say to each other, me and Teresa, you know what, we're not going to discuss people and what they did right and wrong today because it will ruin our children. Amen? We just ought not do it. We shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. Whatever happened to loving each other? Amen? You see, when we deal with forgiveness and this problem in the right way, only then can embarrassing matters be put to rest? Only then can both offended and offender walk together? Hello? Like it never happened? You know what most, most offender and offenses are by Christian people 
and they're uh, at opposite ends of, of, the, of the state, and they won't have nothing to do with each other, and they're talking about each other. And the, the, really the sad part is that we're going to be next to each other, standing in our white robes, standing next to the throne in heaven, singing praises and going, hey, who let you in here? And you say, well, who let you in here? Hello? Sad, isn't it? You see, forgiveness is the right way to deal with sin. And by the way, talking about this worldly idea, nothing is settled by just accepting the way it is. Okay, we'll just accept it, that they are messed up. No, there is work to be done. There is prayers to be prayed. There is, a, 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 you know, a love to be shown. There is things to be done, amen? That's what makes us different. That's what makes us God's people. We are not to be condoning. We are not to be just, okay, put a big, put a big band-aid over it and it'll all go away. And you know what I'm talking about. You have a rebellious child. And, oh, it'll all go away. And the next thing you know, it's worse and it's worse and it's worse. It doesn't go away. It just gets worse. You see, a forgiving church is often misunderstood by the world and by worldly Christians. Hello? I'm going to say this. Please don't be offended, but I'm going to say it and just be honest straight up with you this morning. A lot of church members are the ones that get upset the most when we try to minister and help people that need help. Are you with me? And instead of coming and, and saying, what can I do to help? We're there to throw coals on the fire and take them out back and shoot them. Oh, man. We should all do what we can to be exercising the true biblical alternative of biblical forgiveness. If we want to become the church that God wants us to be, hey, we may never run 6,000 here, amen? Probably not. But what if this is Gideon's army? This is something he said in the Bible about numbers. Maybe he just sent a few of them home and you're what's left. And God wants to do something special with you folks right here today. He wants to use you in a mighty way. And this is what he wants to be his church today. A church of forgiveness. Why not come to a church that loves you and forgives you and restore you? But yet people want to go to a place where they get beat up, told off, spit on, yelled at, screamed at. That's not ministry. That's the world's way. You see, do you know true forgiveness? The only real true forgiveness we ever find is in Jesus Christ. Yes. It's not in the brethren, unfortunately, most of the time. And I'm not stepping on your toes today. I'm just stating some truth of why it is that our churches aren't growing and people don't want to come to church anymore. Why come to church and get beat up? You can stay home and fight. I can do that. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, that's right. We can just do that at home. Why, why go to church and, and put yourself through all that? So we need to learn to be God's church, a forgiving church, the forgiving church right here, the Victory Baptist forgiving church. That no matter who comes through that door, no matter what they look like, no matter what was their past, that we would love them right where... Jesus saw the demoniac. And he loved him. People were afraid. He said, come out of that man, you bunch of demons. <laughs> and then he, put, he, went, he, he, got so, he got so righteous, he went and put clothes on. He went running through the town telling everybody that Jesus Christ saved him. See, that's what it's all about, folks. It's not about how evil we are. It's not about what mistakes we've made. 
It's about what God can do with you from this moment forward, right now, this morning, right now, today, right here in God's house at the Victory Baptist Church, right this moment, that God is touching your heart and He's asking you to do something for Him. And you're gonna and don't you dare sit there this morning when I call the invitation and you need to come down to this old altar and get on your hands and knees and pray that God would use you in a wonderful and mighty way as a forgiving person. And I want to say something to you, church. Every single one of us should be on our knees at this altar this morning asking God to make us more forgiving of one another. This is a very special picture. You probably can't see it from there. It says the touch of the Master's hand. The story behind this picture. I had a boss. Nobody liked him. He was a little weird. But he had the greatest heart. And he loved people. But you had to get to know him. He was kind of hard to work for. He was a very hard man. Hard. He worked hard. Hardest working man I ever knew. He taught me everything I knew about hard work. And I learned to work hard around him and he became my friend. And we began to get to know one another and really enjoy each other's company. He was my boss. He retired from the Dorothy Lane Market and he was gone a few years and they had a 70th birthday party for him down at the Marriott. And I, I was at a, a, a store one day and I had just done a funeral. I had a few bu bucks in my pocket and I saw this picture. And I thought, you know, I'm the old violin. But the master played me and made me what I am. Because of men like Helga. That's his name. His name was Helga Duflark. He's a Norwegian. I'm telling you, he's a hard man. Hard man. But I loved him so much. I began, we began to love each other. And his 70th birthday, I bought this picture. It's a story here. You're going to believe this. And I wrote on the back, you saw in me something that no one else could see. You know what it says? Your friend forever. He's in heaven now. Reverend William Keene, on the occasion of your 70th birthday. He died about two weeks ago. Alzheimer's. Went on to be in heaven. The family called me and they said, we want you to have that picture. I didn't buy this picture to have it back. I gave it, you see, it's so special now. He hung it up in his living room right by the door because they reminded him of me. What? And you know, in the last days of his life, he only remembered two people's names and mine was one of them. He wrote, we just loved one another. And God blessed that. He did more, and does one of the men in my life. And at the funeral, after it was all over, and I got to say goodbye to him, the family and the sons, who I never got along with. We didn't really never get, we, we didn't have fights or anything, but we just didn't see eye to eye or much. And his oldest son handed this to me, and he said, I want you to have that. The touch of the master's hand. Why? Helga forgave me and saw something in me that nobody else saw. That's the way it is, folks. The touch of the Master's hand, when He touches us, He changes us. He changes you forever. Let's all stand this morning. Heads bowed, eyes closed, and musicians coming. We're going to sing Almost Persuaded. Are you... Have you are you persuaded this morning? You need to come to an old-fashioned altar today.